Maggie Dietz is a poet and an editor from Boston area. For many years, she directed the National Favorite Poem Project, and as co-editor, she worked with Robert Pinsky on three anthologies related to the project, including Americans' Favorite Poems, Poems to Read, and An Invitation to Poetry. Her own poetry has been published in a number of journals, and she has been the recipient of awards, including the Grolier Poetry Prize, the George Bennett Fellowship, and fellowships from New Hampshire State Council on the Arts and the Fine Arts Center in Provincetown. Maggie has taught at BU, and she teaches creative writing concentration at the University of Massachusetts at Lowell. In the New York Times, reviewer David Kirby wrote that uh, Maggie's writing has been described as intimate, idiomatic, and thoroughly original, and it's a pleasure to be led through her world as she looks at familiar subjects with fresh eyes. Her first book, Perennial Fall, won the New Hampshire Jane Kenyon Award for Outstanding Book of Poetry and Wisconsin Library Association Literary Award, and her latest book, of poetry is that kind of happy. And she is here to share some of her poetry with us today. So please give a round of applause for Maggie Dietz. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna read from my new book. It came out about a month ago, um, That Kind of Happy. And I'll start with the poem um, that includes that line. Um, I decided uh, to, to just go up. Now, now this is going to be on television, so everything might change. I don't know. No. Um, <clears throat> I decided to just go for it, and the title of the poem is Zoloft. Um, I, didn't, I didn't mess with the generics, but I was pretty sure that um, no one from Pfizer, no Pfizer executive, was going to read um, my book of poems. So um, here it is, Zoloft. Two weeks into the bottle of pills, I'd remember exiting the one-hour lens grinder at Copley Square, the same store that years later would be blown black and blood-spattered by a backpack bomb at the marathon. But this was back when terror happened elsewhere. I walked out wearing the standard Boston graduate student wire rims, my first ever glasses, and saw little people in office tower windows working late under fluorescent lights. File cabinets with drawer seams, blossomed wire bins, and little hands answered little black telephones, rested receivers on bloused shoulders, real as the tiny flushing toilets, the paneled wainscoting and armed candelabras I gasped at as a child in the miniatures room at the Art Institute in Chicago. It was October, and I could see the edges of everything. Where the branches had been a blur of fire, now there were scalloped oak leaves, leathery maple five points, plain as on the Canadian flag. When the wind lifted the leaves, the trees went pale, then dark again, in waves. Exhaling manholes, convenience store tiled with boxed cigarettes and gum, the BPL's forbidding fixtures lit to their razor tips and Trinity's windows holding individual panes of glass between bent metal like hosts in a monstrance. It was wonderful. It made me horribly sad. It was the same years later with the pills. As I walked across the field, the usual field to the same river, I felt a little burst of joy when the sun cleared a cloud. It was fricking Christmas and I was five years old. I laughed out loud, picked up my pace. The sun was shining on me, on the trees, on the whole damn world. It was exhilarating and sad, that sham. Nothing had changed, or I had, but who wants to be that kind of happy? The lenses, the doses, nothing should be that easy. So this poem um, comes out of a, a real life experience. Um, uh, 
I, deer are such gentle um, animals, and <laughs> this comes from an experience when I, I thought they were basically demonic and the most terrifying <laughs> things I'd ever seen. Um, and so it, it's, it's rooted in something that actually happened, but it, it's sort of the poem sort of takes a turn into the, the unreal. Are we there yet? On the drive from Des Moines, deer along the highway's gravel shoulder, deer's eyes flaring from corridors of corn. Lithe, narrow-faced silhouettes of deer beneath rare mosquito-swarmed streetlights, more numerous than the streetlights, floating above alfalfa, soybeans, hay, the grid of roads dividing fields from fields. Death is like the softest scarf settling over your face. My grandfather knew this because he died a year before he died. He'd felt it, wasn't afraid. That night, the deer were spirits drifting, foraging, so many souls of the damned. Hundreds surfaced as you drove, and twice I saw the handkerchief drifting down from heaven, felt it brush my eyes, my chin. A yearling first, and miles later, a sharp-racked buck leapt onto the road in front of the car, the larger it seemed right over the ticking hood. Death is silk, is cashmere. It wasn't how I wanted us to end. Didn't we make it to sunrise? I thought so. I was certain. I remember the dew across the even stalks like sheets of muslin, the phosphorescent lake hung with mist. You're so nice, you cl you're clapping. Um, <laughs> This uh, this poem comes from, um, I live in Exeter, New Hampshire, and I walk a lot there in the woods, and um, I, am, I am not a birder. Maybe someday I will have time to be a birder. Um, but I, I am an observer, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, this comes out of um, those walks, which I also mentioned in the first poem. This is, uh, the poem's titled Kill Deer, and I, d I think it explains um, sort of what that bird does. So I'll just read it. Kill deer. The bird limped through my dreams, my days. I'd seen it for two weeks, stitching steps across the ball field, swift as a jacket zipper. It'd see me coming and rake one wing across the grass, hitch in its giddy up, coarse notes pitched from its throat, a trick to draw me away from the naked nest, nothing but a couple of pebbles, a few strands of dry grass tufting three ink-stippled ivory eggs, smooth as Dalmatian jasper. How brutally stupid it must have looked the morning the room-sized rotary mower cleared the field, the bird's gimp instinct, rising cries, unnoticed by the driver and nothing to the blade. So, um, one of the things I like to think about is how um, dream life and imagined life often is sort of more vital um, than what we call real life. Um, this poem's titled Downtown. Hard not to notice the necklace in the window flashing in shadows of passersby draped on a stand of flocked foam whose design suggests clavicles and attenuated elegance even in the partial. The pendant, a threaded symbol or temple gong suspended from strands of embroidery thread strung at the base with carved coral painted wooden beads then wound into twisted ropes of glass, beads red and tiny as tobiko that meet in a loop and coin clasp. Nothing I would wear, nonetheless appealing, nonetheless arresting in its almost gaudy exoticism. I'd like to meet who buys it. I'd like to see in 50 years the granddaughter with unusual taste inherit it, wear it with jeans and a t-shirt and earrings she bought for a song. I already miss her, that curious girl from later, her bright eyeliner. 
I've already gasped the day on the subway, the loop lost hold, and the mercurial beads went instantly everywhere, spraying the seats like so many drops of blood. This is, uh, it took me a really long time um, to write this book. There are 10 years between my first and second book. Um, um, and one of the reasons is that I had two babies on the same day. Um, and, but this is a, one of the first poems I wrote um, met, like a long time ago that um, uh, appears in the book. And it comes out of a time when I wasn't sure there were going to be any um, children. The title is Kempe. And Kempe um, comes from a name in a folk song, um, an American Roots music song called Mole in the Ground. And there are many variations. Some of them have the name Kippy or Tukey or um, Kempe. When I was like you, no one spoke to me. For a while, I'd see you only while I slept, smoky reels of silent family films, often on your birthday. Not anymore. You're cartwheeling past the window now, brown shoes flickering like birds. Scuff kneed with square teeth and a laugh like a rifle shot. Too big for your britches, kid. If you're so smart, what's taking you so long? So the universe is huge. Plenty of people find their way. There's a picture you drew on the fridge, a blue walrus. There's a story you wrote about a kangaroo. Look, take any room. I'm sorry I resisted giving up the study. Let's put it behind us. Remember when you didn't have the croup? I stayed up all night making steam. Remember when you didn't win the spelling bee? We were so proud. Dust and stars, the roads between the moon and sun, the spokes of light wheeling through the room. Where are you living? I keep missing you, stubborn girl. If you're waiting for some better future, it's too late. You've got a mother, Kempe, and you've got a name. <laughs> so since um, Mira read that terrific um, poem about uh, Mary, um, I, I'll read this poem, Galilee, which uh, sort of um, creates a sort of uh, visual um, context for um, the, the world at that time. And Mary might make an appearance at the end of the poem. This, uh, this poem is titled Galilee. Galilee. Much of what there was to see was dull, mouse and ass and sparrow, snake and sand but gold and wool and temple, empire, wine red pomegranates in the trees. The roof over the sea, cerulean calm days, others as drab as fish gut or ash, the sun an eye to some, to some a coin. Mornings hell in the heavens warning sailors to heed the deep beneath them. Evening come, the wild pale horses of the waves delivered fishers to fish, made widows of small fisted wind women, husbands of brothers. Sabbaths the wind wouldn't rest, infants tested their lungs, late sacrifices blazed on an altar where a poor man prayed, then stole the bread. Beggars clothed in nerves bellowed, a girl crouched, at an open window, above the fuss of lovers' grunts and lepers' bells, the white rustling of wings. <laughs> Just read maybe three more poems. Um, one of the things the book takes up is um, my having lost my father, um, who died of cancer now almost four years ago. And um, this is the first po poem I, I wrote during that time when he had um, just uh, been diagnosed. Diagnosis Dream. 
We sit together at the table of sleep, brown-eyed maple set with fine bone china, heavy silver. A horse snuffs in the corner. The eyes in the wood grain blink, watch us as we wait to eat the untold dishes steaming in lidded terrines. The horse neighs. There's news, you say. You say the news. Now the table's a bridge, and you are on the other side. My legs can't climb up without failing. Without you, I cannot get to you. You're riding the dining horse, already tiny on the horizon. You don't see me trying. When I cry out, the sky eats your name. The wind thickens. Water wells up under the bridge. The glazed terrines float by me. One by one, I lift the lids. Empty, 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 empty. So this poem um, takes up, um, I decided I, I would make a lullaby because there was sort of an intersection of um, ha my having young children and, and losing my father. Um, and um, there's a Lyle Lovett song, um, if I had a boat, I'd go out on the ocean. If I had a pony, I'd ride him on my boat. So I, I stole his formula. Um, so this is lullaby after Lyle Lovett. If I had a ginkgo tree, I'd climb it in the evening. If I had a marmoset, he'd climb the tree with me. If we saw a falling star, I'd wish I had a rocket. If I had a rocket, I'd drag the star back home. If I went to space, I'd pick up a satellite. If I had my own moon, I wouldn't be so sad. If I weren't so sad, I wouldn't need a companion. If I sold my marmoset, I'd have a lot of cash. If I had some money, I'd buy an Eldorado, silver, 1959, with fins like raptor wings. I'd shine that Eldorado and drive it to my father's. If I had a father, I'd take him for a ride. I'll end with a, um, it's maybe the only funny poem in the book. How's that? <laughs> um, so a couple of things about this poem. Uh, the title is Another Day, Another Dolor. Um, oh. And that, <laughs> that um, is a phrase that my, my husband has thrown around for years. My husband is, is also a writer. And, um, I, um, I decided I would use it for this poem title, and um, I, so I asked him, where does that come from? And he said, well, oh, I think it's Samuel Beckett. And, you know, of course I did my due diligence and, and looked it up, and in fact it's from, it's a line from a poem, a little tiny aphoristic poem by Ogden Nash. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't think you could get sort of um, more polar uh, <laughs> uh, poets, however, um, it, it, I love that it's it's the one thing Ogden Nash said that Samuel Beckett might have right. So, uh, so um, the other thing uh, to say about this poem is that it it makes a joking reference to a Carl Sandburg poem called "The Grass." The last lines of that poem are, "I am the grass, let me work," um, and I think that's all you need to know. Another day, I'll finish with this poem too. Another day, another dolor. That one morning, as you straightened your Shakespeare theme tie before heading off to teach Hamlet, you sighed and said in your wax Spanish, el otro dia, el otro dinero. And I sighed bigger and said, yes, the other day, the other money. Or the time I was trying not to spill wine on a pile of papers, writing hieroglyphs in two big margins, and you kept coming in, so finally, mean-voiced, mean I said, let me work, and you said, I am the grass, then half-beat over your shoulder, smoke me. But that wasn't as good 
<laughs> as the day my parents were trying to remember the first name of some former mayor of Green Bay. On the same day, a baby bunny got stuck in their garage. And after dinner, my mom was half dozing when my dad came in and said, the bunny is out and his name is Paul. Mm -hmm. And my mom said, how do you know his name is Paul? And realizing she meant the bunny, he said, because I checked his little wallet and found his little ID. <laughs> then there was that time, not two years later, in a fluorescent hospital room when he was in and out of morphine sleep. And we'd all four kids come from our lives for his dying. And mom was there, of course. And dad woke up from, we imagined, an ancestral dream and seemed surprised to see us, that we'd been there at bedside for days. And he cleared his throat. We angled in to hear if he'd say something wise. And he did, he said, I guess you're wondering why I called this meeting. <laughs> Every day is a fresh beginning. In my soul to the glad refrain, and in spite of old sorrows and older sinning, troubles forecasted and possible pain. Thank you. After
afternoon slides into evening in the narrow city park. I wander towards the river bank beside a long, low waterfall. It's morning season. The alewife leap and twist, struggle to vault the falls. Perched on midstream logs, ravenous seagulls cock their heads and screech defiance. Beside me, on the shore, lay ocean families, young and middle-aged. I saddle on the concrete rim. A young girl sidles up, inspects my strange white face, touches my eyes with hers, sits down on the bank, beside me on my left, but not too close. Foreign phrases ebb and flow. Above us on the cemented dam, Asian fishers cast their lines into the surge. A man wades back and forth along the river's edge, trousers rolled up and empty hands alert to snatch a thrashing streak of silver. Around me, fishing talk, the familiar alien ritual. My name is Louise Coleman. I'm with Greyhound Friends on Saddle Hill Road in Hopkinton. We uh, have an adoption kennel here and we have greyhounds, but we also have started having hounds and hound crosses and beagles. We're always here, seven days a week, nine to five. Our website is greyhound.org and our phone number is 508-435-5969. So uh, we're open to the public all the time. Just uh, give it a